Would you turn with me this morning in your Bible to Mark chapter 15. Mark 15. And we're going to look at a few of these verses today as we think together about Calvary. Would you stand to honor the Lord? Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 20. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the beauty of your word that describes for us in vivid detail the crucifixion of Jesus. And Father, we pray today that you would draw us around the cross. And even though we may have heard the story of Calvary many times, may it be as if we were hearing it for the very first time. Help us, Lord God, to open our hearts to you. To look full into your face. And to understand the price that Jesus paid for us. And thank you, Jesus, for loving us enough to die in our place. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Please have a seat. The place where Jesus died is called in Scripture Golgotha. That is a word that means the place of a skull. Standing from a distance and looking at that hill, it looks eerily like a, the skull of a human being. In fact, there's a bus station at the foot of that hill today. And business goes on all the time out of that bus station. And it was business as usual the day that Jesus died. But Golgotha, or Calvary, is the place where heaven and earth comes together. It is the place where the wisdom of God and the power of God and the love of God were on display for all the world to see. And in all four of the gospel accounts, the Bible gives us these events that took place around the cross. Now I want you to think with me about three things today. First, we notice here the pathway to the cross. Now the pathway to the cross is known today as the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrows. It was about a mile long. It was the path that Jesus walked when he went out to be crucified at Calvary. But actually, the Bible tells us that the pathway to the cross began in eternity. In the book of the Revelation, the Bible says that Jesus was the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. That simply means that in the heart of God, from the very beginning of eternity, God determined that one day there would be a cross. God knew that He was going to create us. And God knew that we were going to sin. And God knew when He put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden that they would sin and that all of us would be born into sin and be stained and tainted with sin. So out in eternity, before the foundations of this world were ever laid, the Bible says God determined that His Son, the Lord Jesus, would give His life and shed His blood to pay the price for our sin. The cross was not an ambulance sent to an accident. 
The cross was not an afterthought with God. But rather the cross was in the forethought of God because God determined from all eternity that there would be a cross. The cross was on God's drawing board for countless eons of ages. God determined that Jesus would die for our sin. So the world became an altar and every tree that God created became a potential place for Jesus to be nailed. And the pathway to the cross did not start in Jerusalem, but it started in eternity. In fact, in the Bible, there is a red river of redemption that runs with the blood of God from the book of Genesis to the book of the Revelation. It begins in Genesis after Adam and Eve sinned against God and blood was shed to provide covering for their sin and clothing for their bodies. That red river of redemption of the blood of God continues to run as Abraham stood on Mount Moriah and took his own son and placed him on an altar ready to sacrifice him and God sent a lamb, a lamb, a ram crowned with thorns. That red river of redemption ran into Egypt land as the nation Israel took the Passover lamb and cut its throat and spread the blood, applied the blood to the doorposts and the lentils of their homes, and they were saved by the blood of the Lamb. That red river of redemption continued to flow into the tabernacle when the priest would take the the little lambs and apply the blood for the sins of the people. It flowed through the book of Psalms when David, years before the crucifixion, wrote, all about the crucifixion and what Jesus would be thinking as He hung on the cross. It flowed as the prophets wrote of the death of Christ. So this pathway to the cross began in eternity and it flowed throughout history. The cross is a pathway. It's the only pathway by which we may know God. The cross is the way to God. But not only do we see the pathway to the cross, we see the people at the cross. There were different people who came to Calvary that day. I heard about a man who had a dream. He dreamed that he, when he went to bed, he dreamed about the cross and he saw the nails in his dream vividly being driven into the hands of Jesus. He saw the spear thrust into the side of our Lord and he saw the crown as it punctured the brow of the Lord Jesus it was more than he could bear and in his dream he said he ran up to the soldier and and put his arms on him and pulled the soldier around and when he saw the soldier's face he was shocked and surprised that it was his own face and that he realized he was the one that put Jesus on the cross And you and I are the ones who put Jesus on the cross. But think with me for a moment about some of the people that were there that day. Look at verse 21 and it talks about a man named Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by to bear his cross. Simon was at Calvary because of compulsion. He really didn't want to be there. Look at that word compel in Scripture. It means to be pressed into service. It means to make somebody do something that they do not want to do. It's what you do to a little six-year-old boy when it's bath time before he goes to bed at night. You compel him to do something that he really doesn't want to do. There may be somebody here today because you were compelled to be here. Perhaps you really didn't want to come. And I have a feeling that day when Simon came to the cross and saw the blood of Jesus run down into the dirt and make red pools at his feet, that Simon's heart was bound to Jesus that day. And he was wonderfully saved. You say, how do you know that? Well, the Bible mentions his sons, Alexander and Rufus. And in Romans 16, there's a man named Rufus who was very familiar to Roman Christians. And many believe that 
when Simon went to the cross that he was saved and he led his boys to faith in Christ and they became preachers in the New Testament church. And then the soldiers were there. It was their job to be there. Normally, four soldiers carried the victim to the cross. They made a hollow square around him. One soldier would carry a board with the crime written on that board. And in verse 26, you see what it says. And the inscription of his accusation was written above. King of the Jews. Well, there's news for us. Not only was he king of the Jews, but he's king of every king. And he's Lord of every Lord. And one day, every knee shall bow. We'll all bow before the Lord Jesus. But to these callous soldiers, it was a job. Their hearts were hard. The crucifixion didn't mean anything to them. And there are a lot of people in the world like that today. They don't care about the death of Jesus. It means nothing to them. The Bible says in verse 27 that there were two thieves there. Three crosses. One man died in sin. One man died to sin. And Jesus died for sin. And every one of us will die on one of those two crosses. We will either die in sin or we will die to sin. We will die believing or we will die unbelieving. The believing will die and go to heaven and the unbelieving will die and go to hell. And that's why the cross is so important. How will we die? Look at what it says in verse 28. It says, He was numbered with the transgressors. That means that He identified Himself with the crimes of the thieves that were being killed that day with Him. And He identifies with our sin. Like the man in the dream, all of us were there. And that's why, no matter how many times we've heard the story of the cross, that it ought to touch our heart. Well, we see the pathway to the cross and the people at the cross. And then we notice here the purpose of the cross. The Gospel of Mark is filled with stories that illustrate to us the purpose of the cross. The purpose that God had in mind. I think of the story of the old man with palsy to whom Jesus said, Your sins be forgiven you. And he was saved. I think of old Legion, that man who was filled with demons and Jesus cast those demons out and Legion was saved. I think of that little dead girl and how they brought her to Jesus. And there, Jesus gave her life, brought her back from the dead, and she was gloriously saved. There was the woman with the prolonged illness that just wanted to touch the hem of his garment, and she was made whole by her faith. She was saved. And there were many others saved of their physical ailments, saved from their sins. And the Bible says, you shall call his name Jesus, and he shall save people from their sins. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful for Jesus? What's the biggest problem we face today? There are a lot of problems, a lot of international problems and national problems, and all of us have our own problems, but the biggest problem we face today can be summarized in one little word, S-I-N, sin. And that's why Jesus died. He died to save us from our sin. And that's the purpose of the cross. Have you ever thought about what it was that held Jesus to that cross? Was it the tenacity of those nails that they put through His hands? Was it the fear of the soldiers that kept Him on the cross? No. It was God's love that kept Jesus on the cross. It was the love of God. He was not sparing Himself in order to save me and you. And that's the meaning of the cross. Jesus dying to save us. I want to tell you a story this morning. 
that I heard years ago in a revival meeting, and I never forgot that story. It had such an impact. I've told it all over the place since I heard it. The story was about a young married man with two small children who went on a business trip to a large city. And he checked into his hotel room for the evening. He was all alone. He didn't have anything to do. He was bored. He let temptation get the best of him. And he went down to the hotel bar to have a drink. As he was sitting in that bar, he heard two men having a conversation about a notorious bar in that city called the Gates of Hell. And he interrupted the men. And he said, excuse me, but I'm a salesman and I'm spending the night in this city. And I overheard your conversation about this bar called the Gates of Hell. And I wondered if you might tell me how to get there. One of the men said, it's the most crowded place in all the city. And there's always a long line of people waiting to get in. And he said, you need to take a cab and go down to Broad Street. It's a dead-end street. And you'll have to get out and walk because there will be so many people. And he said, as you walk down that street toward the end of the street, you'll know you're getting close to that bar called the Gates of Hell when you pass a little church up on a hill on your right. And the name of the church is Calvary. He said, just after you pass the church, you'll find the gates of hell. Well, the young man took a cab and he headed to that place. And just as he had been told, he had to get out and walk because the crowd was so great. And as he walked down Broad Street, he came to a place where he heard singing. And he turned and looked up and saw the singing coming from a little church up on a hill and he noticed a small sign in front of the church with just the word, Calvary. He stood there, and he listened. And that singing reminded him of his boyhood days. The days when his mother and father had taken him to church, but he knew in his heart that he was very far from God. And he thought of his wife and his children and at that moment, something happened. The young man turned away from the gates of hell. And he went up to Calvary. And he walked inside that little church where the choir was rehearsing. And he sat down in a pew at the back. And as he listened, they were singing, Years I spent in vanity and pride. Caring not, my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me, he died at Calvary. And in those quiet moments, that young man headed for the gates of hell, bowed his head, and asked Jesus Christ to come into his life and save him. As he finished praying, he felt a hand on his shoulder. And he looked up and saw the pastor of the church, and they chatted for a while. The young man told the pastor what had happened, and the pastor rejoiced with him. And then they stood and walked to the door, and they walked out on a little porch and stood on that porch overlooking the hill, watching all those people headed to that notorious bar. And the pastor said to him, Isn't it amazing? You have to walk right past Calvary to get to the gates of hell. Friend, listen. Stop at Calvary. Don't you walk past Calvary and go to the gates of hell. Jesus died on the cross to save you. And today, if you will place your faith in Him, He'll save you right now. He'll come into your heart and He'll save you right now. And all God's people said, Amen. let's stand and we're going to pray. Our Father, thank You for the simple gospel story. I am so thankful, God, You made it so simple. And yet it cost You everything You had to give the life of your only begotten Son.
And Father, today we pray a prayer of praise. Those of us who have stopped at Calvary and experienced you by faith, we, we praise you and thank you, Jesus, for saving our soul. And Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters here today that have not had that experience. And we pray today that they would stop at Calvary and open their heart to you and that you would come in. Lord, today, may you work in hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, the invitation is very simple. If you will stop at Calvary today, if you will open your heart and let Jesus come in today, as we sing here in the sanctuary and in the Christian Life Center, as the singing begins, if you will stop at Calvary and open your heart to Jesus today, you step forward and make a public confession of your faith. Just step forward. Our pastors will be here to receive you. Listen, don't you walk past Calvary. Don't you go to the gates of hell. Today's your day. You stop at Calvary. You come as we sing.